Hello everyone, um, thank you for coming. Um, I'm Andy Tennant, I'm the Technology Director for Studios at ITV, uh, one of the broadcasters in the UK. And together with Kevin Burrows, um, who's the CTO of Channel 4, we're two of the members of the management board of the Digital Production Partnership. Um, Anwar invited us here today to talk about the work we've been doing in the UK since 2010, to standardise initially our tape-based approach to delivery, and now our file-based approach to delivery, and to talk a little bit about the benefits of that, what, what decisions we made, why we made them, um, and what the benefits were financial, technical and creatively to that. And I'll talk about that over the next 20 minutes or so, and then Kevin will go into more detail around some of the technical aspects of the standard, and we'll have time for questions at the end. Good so far? So the reason why we did this is also really the history of the DPP on a timeline. So back in 2010, the independent production community in the UK Talk to us as public service broadcasters, the BBC, ITV and Channel 4, the bodies that fund the Digital Production Partnership, and said to us, um, you all have a tape-based standard, you all have a tape-based standard for HD, but you're all slightly different. Can it not be beyond the wit of you as three broadcasters, please, not to get together and just standardise that tape-based delivery format so that it's all exactly the same and I don't have to think about it? And that was the, the birth, really, of the Digital Production Partnership, which was the three public sector broadcasters, public service broadcasters in the UK, saying, let's get together and let's see whether we can talk and, and agree a common standard for tape-based delivery in the UK. And we achieved that by um, March 2011. But we were plainly on an inexorable path to not only file-based delivery, but acquisition on file, editing through file, through to delivery on file, and then consumption and getting to those final endpoint platforms without any tape in the process. So we took a view not to stop there, but actually to start the process of thinking, what might a file-based standard look like? And just as we've agreed on tape, could we agree on file as well? And at the same time, we started looking at the rest of the UK industry and how prepared they were. And that led to this report in September 2011, which we called the Reluctant Revolution, which was, we're on this inexorable path to file base from end to end. How ready are our production colleagues? How ready are our creatives? And do they really want to go there? Um, you can read the report and some of the other reports that I refer to and documents that I refer to. They're all available on the website, digitalproductionpartnership.co.uk. They're all free. Please go and help yourself. So that was 2011. The work having started in, in 2010 to get to a tape-based standard just evolved absolutely into the file-based group. So Kevin leads a technical standards group uh, which meets on a fortnightly basis and the work through 2011 was to get to a common HD file-based technical and metadata delivery standard which we successfully published at the start of 2012 but at that point we didn't set any dates. We said this is the aspiration for us as UK broadcasters at the point where we choose to migrate to file-based delivery, this is the standard we will hold you to. So dear manufacturers, dear production companies, dear broadcasters, this is the thing you need to prepare yourself for. But the real benefit here is that there will be no, once you've actually made this transition, it will be the same for every broadcaster in the UK. It doesn't matter who you're delivering to, we have a single standard and it's the same. Around the middle of that year, we continued our work with the creative communities and the production management communities, and we published something called the Bloodless Revolution. That was a first attempt to say, when you are considering what you need to do when you're acquiring on file, going through a production process and delivering on file, what might your workflow look like? It didn't set out to say, here's an ideal workflow. It set out to give the production communities some idea of what to think about and some, some candidate ideas and candidate workflows where you could say, if I've at least considered all of these points, I probably have a manageable workflow. And again, that's available as a report that you can download from, from the website. We also started some work in, in August of 2012 to look at um, what sort of training would be required. So there are some fundamental changes as we move to file-based, as we all know. Not only have we seen shooting ratios go out of the window, but actually the, the single biggest change that we've needed to consider is, um, for the most part, when productions are producing, what they do is they choose a camera. And they choose a camera because they think it's going to look good, and everything else has to get sorted out afterwards. And one of the things we were trying to encourage was, 
how do you how you need to consider your camera choice in the context of your workflow your editing tool your storage tools and how you're going to get to that file based delivery format so we started doing some work from august 2012 to think about what sort of formalized training if any our industry might need and then in September 2012, and Kevin can go into more technical detail for this if, if you're interested, we released a metadata application. This was our attempt um, in advance of manufacturers getting to the point of being able to generate AVCI files to our file-based delivery standard to provide a wrapping tool that would allow us and allow productions to be able to add the metadata they need to their AVC file, their DPP compliant file, and then uh, rewrap the header with the additional metadata because one of the one of the big changes that we have with our file-based delivery standard is there is some production metadata required. A really good example is Synopsis. So they need to provide us in about the length of the tweet a description of their program. If they don't do that then they won't be able to deliver their file even if everything else is okay. So there was some learning there and what we wanted to do was to be able to provide a tool which we will continue to support for a few years from now um, in order to be able uh, in order to allow productions to be able to deliver their DPP compliant file with the appropriate metadata. And then at the back end of 2012, um, we published our live delivery standards. So that was again a way of trying to say, can we as broadcasters agree what live delivery standards should be in the UK? There's a few nuances in that, but again, yes, we, we largely managed to do that. And um, all of our delivery standards for all the broadcasters are now hosted on the Digital Production Partnership website. So we don't host them on our own individual broadcaster websites. There are links on our individual broadcaster websites to the DPP website where you can find the generic standard and you can find the, the individual broadcaster versions and the differences are minimal. In 2013, we did some work around production budgeting because one, one of the things we realised was um, all productions were still budgeting basically against a template which was based on tape. So we published some generic um, budgeting templates that were based around file acquisition and file delivery just to help the process. And then our final report um, in May 2013, the final report in the trilogy was called The Creative Revolution. And that addressed whether there was any creative benefit to this at all, or whether it was just something that we were having to do through the inexorable march of technology. And the interesting output of that report was, when you talk to productions, where they saw the most value was at the acquisition end. Their ability to acquire more and more and more content in more and more and more formats. And of course it then becomes our problem to try and find a way of dealing with all of that. Um, again, that report is available for download. And then at IBC last year in September, the standard, the file-based delivery standard, having by that point be, being 18, 19, 20 months old, um, we announced file-based delivery day. And what we said was, as of the 1st of October this year, as public service broadcasters in the UK and as commercial broadcasters in the UK, we will only accept AVCI 100 file deli files as our file delivery standard and we won't accept tape anymore. There are one or two nuances in that. The BBC internally will be running a little bit behind that 1st of October deadline. BT Sport and Channel 5 are largely already there. Channel 4 and ITV will be there by the 1st of October this year. And fundamentally that means that if you are delivering content to a UK broadcaster after the 1st of October this year, then you must deliver as a file and it must be to that file-based delivery standard. So we got there. Or at least we're hoping we'll get there by October this year. This year then has really been about supporting the industry, supporting manufacturers, supporting the production community and supporting the post-production community to help make sure we're ready for that 1st of October deadline 20, in 2014. Um, Kevin will talk about the compliance programme that we announced a couple of weeks ago in a few minutes time. That's about making sure uh, that when manufacturers issue products though, and they say those products are DPP compliant, they genuinely are and they genuinely produce a DPP compliant file. Um, we've issued some guidelines around quality control and we've issued some guidelines around um, cl closed caption standards in the last month or so as well. And we've also issued this. This is file-based delivery for producers and production managers. So this is the non-technical guide. Again, it's available on our website, but it contains simple things such as a producer checklist that you can work your way down and say, if I've gone through all those steps or somebody in my production has on my behalf, the chances are I've generated a DPP compliant file, delivered it to a broadcaster, and the broadcaster said that they've received it. 
It also includes, which is really important for production, um, a breakdown of what the metadata fields are and which ones they're responsible for and which ones they therefore need to key in order to be able to deliver their, their, file, their file in a compliant manner and an overarching review of the process and the document steps you through of each step in the process and the things you need to think about, including AQC, auto quality control, and the fact that we would still like you to watch your program before you send it to us. And that's all leading us up to the 1st of October this year. Um, so really the work for, the, for us for the rest of the year is to carry on working with the, with the industry, both at a manufacturer level and at a producer level, to make sure that we're able to um, hit that 1st of October deadline. And then there's some additional work carrying, um, going on from here. Kevin will talk a little bit more about this in a few moments' time. So there's more technical standards work. We, we've stopped and looked and said, is there additional work that we can do which adds value um, to UK broadcasters and to the UK television industry? And we've decided there are around archive and storage, around news exchange formats, which will be a, um, uh, around international receipt and distribution as well, and around commercials. Um, there is some interest hopefully because you're all here in, in the international growth of AS11 and we've been having some of those conversations both at IBC and, and here and happy to take questions either as a group or individually after this session. Um, and um, other policies and guidelines around things such as dig uh, digital storage and standardising production reporting as well because we're now able to do that. And that's how to find us. So there is a fairly active LinkedIn group asking all sorts of questions about the implementation of AS11 and the practical implementation of AS11 in the UK at the moment. Um, you can follow us on Twitter. Hopefully that's one of the ways you found to be here today. Um, there's the website with the downloads of all the documents I've referred to today and all of our other documentation. And you can always contact us, info at Digital Production Partnership. I'll be back with Kevin to answer questions at the end. Kevin's going to dive in and do a little bit more detail now about some of the technical aspects of AS11. Thank you, Andy. So I'm just going to cover a bit more detail in some of the technical aspects and some of the challenges that we've had in setting up the, um, the, the work stream. I think um, one of the important things to say is that uh, we wanted to get everyone involved in it. So even though the PSBs, BBC Channel 4 and ITV funded the DPP. We've had a lot of input from pretty much all the UK broadcasters and some of the post-production companies. So we very much wanted it to be part of uh, working with the industry, not just the people actually funding the, the uh, DPP itself. Can you all hear me okay, sir? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, so some of the challenges we had in setting up the standard, really, um, we, we needed to make sure it was truly a kind of replica um, or as equivalent as possible to uh, SR videotape. So we didn't want a kind of substandard quality. That was one of the key things uh, as part of the decision. Um, we took a very pragmatic approach to the um, type, the actual codec and the bit rate um, in terms of making it practical, um, you know, in terms of the storage required and processing power. So we had to make it feasible for um, people to use otherwise you know it just wouldn't have taken off. Uh, we wanted it based on existing standards so we weren't going to re reinvent the wheel we wanted to expand on existing SIMPD, AMWA and EBU standards um, rather than sort of you know start off anything uh, new. Uh, we needed to include some metadata as Andy mentioned it was very key to actually have some data associated with the file so that was that was absolutely very important for us. Um, it needed to be acceptable throughout the production community. It wasn't to, to, to be too onerous for people to actually take on or they, they wouldn't use it. Um, and it, it, we do appreciate that standards would take time to get adopted. And that's why we're, we're kind of starting now to get deliveries ramping up. It, it was, um, as Andy said, January 2012 when we actually set the, when we, when we ratified the standard. Um, and we're now giving an October deadline, so we've, we've given people quite a lot of time to get uh, through the process. Um, and the other key thing, we wanted it to be not too new, but also um, not something that was going to um, be only have a short lifetime, so we needed a sort of around about five years lifespan to make it um, applicable and, and uh, have a bit of future going forward. So these are some of the things uh, Andy touched on these, but some of the things just to expand on that how we're working with the industry to actually support the standard. I think there's one thing in coming up with a standard, but the other, another thing is kind of getting people on board and talking to people and getting it implemented. So we very much wanted to work with the industry to do that. 
Um, so we've so we've had working with the production companies for some time. We've we've had a lot of their input. We've been discussing and iterating things through them to make them feel involved as part of the project. Um, we've had regular liaison meetings with uh, some of the pan industry groups in the UK. Um, PACT are the independent uh, production companies, they do a lot of our independent uh, programme commissions. UK Screen represent a lot of the uh, facilities houses in the UK. And PMA, Programme Managers Association, they're the people that actually go out and make programmes and, and actually manage that whole process. So we very much wanted to keep all them involved in the whole sort of process throughout the uh, project. Uh, we've also, as Andy mentioned, we've held regular forums, so about every two or three months in the UK we've got kind of DPP forums, we, we send out uh, mailing lists and we pick a different topic every time. And some of the reports that Andy mentioned have really come out of those, um, so we've, we've kind of announced those as part of the work within the forums. Um, they've been very popular actually. Um, uh, we've also got various reports and documentation on the website so to people guide people through the process and some of the information. Um, if, if they need more um, particular information around anything then we, we've tried to be supportive where possible and, and given uh, made, made you know, as much documentation as possible available. Um, we've also done the metadata app and uh, as Andy mentioned actually just because we wanted people to start using the standard as soon as possible and we knew there was going to be a lag bef between the manufacturers catching up and um, so that was an initiative we started and uh, we've, we've, it has been very successful actually a lot of um, I think it's, it's encouraged a lot of the manufacturers to actually take that up themselves um, in, a, in a relatively short space of time. Uh, we've also been holding regular interoperability days where we've got um, say 30 or so manufacturers in the room um, done sort of files read and write tests, interoperability tests. We've had a lot of, um, we've been quite encouraged actually about the number of people that have turned up to that and uh, we've been very supportive. Um, they, they've actually really wanted to put some effort in and I think you know having that in a kind of independent forum means that people are not, um, they're, they're, they're happy to work together and share. Normally manufacturers working together can be quite difficult but we've done it in a kind of, an end, you know, under the kind of DPP environment which means people are not afraid to kind of show uh, you know sh show and tell on, on various aspects we know it things these things don't always work first time um, and um, the other thing I'm just going to come on to is the setting up of our compliance program just to kind of you know get the industry working a bit more faster really to hit our deadlines and uh, I'll, I'll cover that in just a moment So what we're finding, I think, over the last year is there have been quite a few products coming to the market um, and what we're seeing is you know, a lot of people saying DPP compliant and, and using it in their marketing and we were obviously a bit concerned about it. not that we wanted people not to support it, but what does DPP compliant mean? And this is a problem. We, what we didn't want was people buying some equipment from a manufacturer you know, using it to create a programme, delivering it to the broadcaster, then it doesn't work and then it kind of gives the DPP a bad name and, you know, someone could quite easily say, look, they bought this thing and said it was compliant and you're telling me the programme's not, uh, not, not uh, acceptable. So um, we wanted to kind of work through that and we, um, we, we, we sort of really want to make sure that the products go through a minimum set of criteria and that way we can try and get some sort of compliance together. It's not going to be obviously we, we can gauge where we feel the, the level of compliance needs to be it's it's obviously higher than it is at the moment but we want to try and start off with a, a kind of phase one level and then build on that depending on how how manufacturers start uh, coming together um, and we want to kind of get an expectation of consistency and quality again with products so if some manufacturers they may think they're totally compliant but when they put it in some other part of a workflow down the stream it, it doesn't work very well or it shows up a problem that you may not have otherwise found. So, so part of it is all about the workflow not just the fact that it can create what appears on paper to be a compliant file. Um, the other thing is we wanted to improve communication and testing within the broadcaster so rather than each of the many UK broadcasters doing their own testing and finding similar sort of problems we thought well actually why not coordinate that we've got a 
um, work together so that if if you know ITV get a particular problem, then we should be able to share that knowledge across everyone so that we're not all doing the same work and finding out the same problems, um, and and keeping a kind of communication together about that. And again, just to kind of help up the speed of adoption, really was one of the key things to to, to kind of aim for our October deadline. Um, what was interesting actually before the last interoperability day, you probably can't see it very well, but we, we, we sent a question out to the questionnaire out to the people that came along saying, you know, do you currently believe your products are DPP compliant? And it was quite interesting that 54% said they were. Um, this is obviously before we've really defined what we mean by compliance. So there's a lot of people there, you know, a lot of people quite rightly thinking, yes, they've done a lot of good work, but it was, it was interesting that that actually was, was, was quite high. This was from all ranges of types of product, both readers, writers, uh, workflow tools and that kind of thing. The other thing that we asked just out of interest was um, do you, you know, do you intend to release compliant products and if so when and we thought it would be a good idea to gauge some reaction. Um, and again you, you can't see it there but the first box is yes within three months so we had 26% which is over a quarter. Um, within six months took it up another 8% so you know 30, 34%. Within 12 months another 6%. Um, no time scale. You can see about two thirds out, or nearly two thirds, with no time scale. Obviously, some of those manufacturers might be doing something for the longer term. So it's quite interesting to hear that um, a lot of them really were, uh, you know, longer term trying to commit to that. And and, and at the moment, say 40% just were, were saying probably not. Um, and it could be depending on the type of product, it may not have been worth the, the worthwhile uh, doing it. There are some sort of aspects of the industry where they, they may not have actually felt it you know it fitted their business model so so really the the aims of the program that we're setting up um, we're building on the success really of the interoperability so it's just kind of expanding on that getting more people uh, working together being, doing it more regularly we've had the interoperability, interoperability days running about every four to six months and we think while that was useful we want to kind of make that a bit more regular um, we're setting up a centralised test facility between all the broadcasters in the short term just to be able to fast track some of that work. Um, we appreciate that we want to eventually move to cell certification but that's going to take some time. So that, that test facility will be both use, used by the OEMs plus the broadcasters themselves. So if the broadcasters get delivered a file they want to really look at in detail they can do that at the uh, test facility. Um, as I mentioned before, the other thing we want to do is set up the minimum level of compliance. So we're, we're sort of working at the moment on a kind of phase one where we think we've got a reasonable compromise. These are the things we need to be uh, qualified to make it uh, DPP compliant. Um, and the other thing we're, we're currently discussing with Amwar how that whole process of certification is going to work because we very much want to do it across the industry and tied in with a, the AMWA who are you know, instrumental in managing some of these standards and that, that whole process. So we've got uh, some current discussions ongoing at the moment. Um, we're going to employ a dedicated test manager to kind of manage that facility in the short term and uh, funded by the DPP members just to kind of kick that off and we'll review that in, a, say, six months' time when we know how that's gone. Um, and one of the key things is we want to make it open to all manufacturers, not just um, certain ones. It, it's really anyone who's interested in making compliant products can come along and engage. So we're, we're not, uh, not being biased at all. We just want to make it as open as possible. So as part of um, well, what we're doing is getting them to kind of sign up to, to being part of that. And, and uh, there's a few terms and conditions in, in them doing that. It just means they have to abide by some certain conditions. One of them is basically committing to, to work to DPP compliant products, which is fair enough. It doesn't mean they have to have them on day one when they sign up. Clearly the whole point of the program is to actually get people from where they are to being DPP compliant. So that's the, that's the, the process we're going through. Um, they, we also want them to participate with other OEMs. We don't want them to kind of stay in a silo. We like to encourage people to share files across different companies and uh, not be afraid of that. I think at the end of the day, it does benefit everyone. And that's, that's really key to being able to do that. Uh, we want some commitment to attending the interoperability days to, to make it more possible to share across manufacturers and all learn by that sort of experience. Um, 
um, and also re undertake some required advanced testing. So we don't want people turning up really using this as a, a way to develop their products. We like them to do some as much as possible in advance and actually just get to the point of testing and finding the odd thing really, rather than use our test lab as a whole development facility. We don't really want that. So, so some onus on them to actually have done some work up front to make sure that they're ready to have that tested rather than developing it from scratch. And also, the, the, like as, as you all realise, everything, every product goes through development phases. They come through software releases to add new features or to correct bugs. So we very much want to kind of manage that process and make sure that people retest and still uh, become part of the programme by um, letting us know when they're doing updates and, and giving us testing data so that we can, we can still carry on and make their product still keep it compliant on the current time. What we don't want is for a company to have said it's compliant and they do a couple of software releases later down the line, it just doesn't work anymore, there's some bug that comes up. So very much want to ma maintain that quality relationship. And, and that really is part of that, just making sure that we retest products um, independently as well, in, at least initially, to, to kind of encourage that and make sure that they do actually put the effort into keeping it compliant. So just picking up on some of the points that Andy mentioned about some of our sort of future work really. Um, AQC is, is something Andy mentioned briefly, but this is a, a program work we're doing with the EBU and we're trying to sort of standardise all the QC parameters. So there's various QC companies around the show you'll see and we've very much got to the point now where we want the production companies to take on QC on our behalf, but what we'd like is actually a standardised way of um, setting up their QC parameters. So if we get a QC report, we'd like a kind of DPP template. So for example, you know, periods of silence, black, all these kind of out of gamut errors, all the kind of common things you can automate. There's very, very many that you can't, but the common things you can automate, we'd like to set a template up so the manufacturers can start using that. Um, so we're hoping to get that in place sort of by about uh, IBC time. We're already sort of at prototype stage with those and the EBU are going to announce the kind of their, their work at IBC and basically ours is a kind of UK templated subset of the, the EBU work that's ongoing at the moment. Uh, we just announced a new sub subtitle standard as well which we'll adopt at some point in the future which is based on EBU TT so largely EBU TT but with some additional enhancements. Uh, also looking at digital storage and archive, so there's, there's quite a kind of interest at the moment in the UK about what we do with archive and that's both the broadcasters but also the production companies. Maybe quite different in the US but we've got a lot of smaller production companies that all contribute um, and a lot of them are, you know, they're not sure what to do with the finished masters in the past, they might keep a, an SRT tape on the shelf. But a lot of them might say, you know, looking at, well, can we, can we put it on an archive somewhere? And if you do want to put it in an archive, what sort of format should it be? Uh, and if we then want to get it back for mastering, how, how are we going to do that? So we're kind of t doing some work, just, uh, not just on the technical standards, but the whole policy around archiving and what do we mean by archiving and preservation and that kind of thing. So that's a, a piece of work which is currently in process. Uh, also talking about um, international content, so we've been engaging with some of the US studios about adopting the um, UK AS11 DPP format. There's a fair bit of interest there if they can actually, you know, for them, I know it's not going to be just one international version, there's, there's clearly too many, but if they can at least narrow that down to one in the UK, I think that'll help them quite a lot. So we've had some good engagement for some of the major US studios on that. So we're currently working through that at the moment. Um, as Andy mentioned briefly as well, news exchange format, we kind of set this up as a let's get people together, see if there's any mileage in, in doing anything around news exchange. There's various kind of um, standards out there at the moment. One of the things that um, has come out of project is probably field news exchange is a bit difficult at the moment, but certainly news exchange from a, 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 a company perspective or broadcaster perspective is, is something that they're quite interested in. So we're pursuing that at the moment to see whether we can, we can come up with anything that's going to help the industry. Um, we're also expanding the programme work to commercials and, and interstitials. So commercials have always been file-based for quite a long time in the UK and we're, we're just pulling all the broadcasters' versions together and putting that under sort of consistent specification. 
and again looking at standardised production reporting so this is where you know we all report into our regulatory bodies can we try and sort of simplify that and make it more of a standard so that we can um, you know everyone's not doing something different and it then means some of the production reporting tools out there can can obviously get some economies of scale hopefully if we can if we can manage that